Fajeri. Welcome to um, the Systemic Conversations series. It's lovely to be talking with you. Um, in uh, Where are you, Laura? Which bit of Italy are you in? I'm in Modena. Modena. In- yeah. Just for, for those of us who can't immediately visualize a map of Italy, please explain where Modena is. Modena is near, very near Bologna. Ah which is uh, in the center, no, no, north center of Italy. It's and a little bit uh, about Florence and south of uh, Milano. And, so, and south, southeast of Milano, southwest of Venice, north of Florence. So it, it's a beautiful it, area. When I, when I went to, uh, um, and people probably know Modena from... Uh, is it associated with balsamic vinegar? Am I making this up? Yeah, aceto balsamico. Yes, of course. This is the land of uh, uh, balsamic vinegar. What else? Oh, the... Cars. Sorry? Cars. Ferrari. Oh. Even if not at the moment, they don't seem to be very good. But Ferrari, Maserati, you know, Modena is uh, in the car industry place. Okay. Have you lived traditionally? There? Traditionally, is have you lived there a long time? Oh yes, I have to say all my life. Actually, I was I was born in a town like near Modena, a Castelfranco in Emilia. Uh, I moved to Modena uh, after after my graduation when I started working. How old were you? Oh. How old were you then? Uh, when I moved to Modena, I, I moved to Modena in 1980. So I was uh, 1980. Yes. So I was 32. 32. So I lived in Castelfranco for 30 years. So in these talks, I'm really interested in finding out where people came from. Sounds a lineal idea, I know, but there's some interesting stories people have to tell about where they came from and about where they ended up going to and something about the zigzagging journey on the way. So so, uh, you were born in Castelfranco. Is that what it is? Castelfranco, India. Because and you also have other kind of Castelfranco means free castle. Right. So you can find that as name of towns around Italy. And my Castelfranco is Castelfranco Emilia. Emilia. Emilia, which is the region. Yeah. yeah. You also have other. What, what's the terrain like around there? Is it mountainous? Or- flat. 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 Very flat. Yes. Very flat, not far from the mountains, not far from the sea, but the this area is very flat. Yeah, and what you can see the mountains actually from the window. Oh, yeah, and the, the Apennines. You can see the Apennines from. I know, uh, I know the other side of the Apennines from flying into Pisa and driving up the coastline there and going into the mountains. Yeah, uh, yeah, that mountains. is exactly the other side. Yeah. Of it. Yes. So, um, uh, Laura, th- let's just um, go back to um, uh, 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 what kind of family were you born into? What kind of culture were you born into? Um, I'm now 72. Ooh. So uh, I was born, uh, you know, right after World War II. My parents, very young, they were very young. My mother was 19. And my father, 22, when I was born. And uh, my uh, family was a, it has been always, a working class family. And um, with very uh, strong uh, principles, a socialist. So my father um, has a very, um, strong uh, uh, socialist, uh, you know, perspective 
of the world somehow, even if uh, together with a very, very uh, strong uh, sense of uh, freedom. So I think that the values of my family were, you know, both community and freedom at the same time. Huh? I I have two siblings. So and and uh, they we are we are almost uh, the same age because uh, my sister is a year younger than me, and my brother is a year younger than my sister. So the three of us, you know, we we, we were else. We were peers. We were, you know, we would play together when it was not possible to go out. Fortunately, I had a, a very a childhood that uh, was uh, lived a lot outside on the yard, you know, together with other kids and uh, yeah, of the neighborhood. So was it was it a clo- a town with close streets and uh, um, little space, or was there a lot of space? And how far well, did you go? Well, no, not a lot of space. No, not a lot of space. But um, the, the 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 center of the town is, is um, very much like uh, Bologna, if you know Bologna, with the porticos uh-huh. and and the narrow streets. But right outside of it, this very small city center, you know you would have uh, houses with the yard. Uh, not gardens, but the yard where people could... Uh, kids would play and adults would talk and chat. Mm-hmm. You know, meet uh, there to talk and chat. So it was a very uh, community kind of life. Were there other people in in the town who were also had strong socialist leanings? Oh like... yeah, the majority actually, the majority, the the the, the area in particular, the area where I lived my my first years was known as a place where families were very much, uh, you know, either communist or socialist or yeah. the were they the same kind of socialist or were there different groups of uh, different understandings of socialism? There, there were actually because you had the Communist Party, the Socialist Party and the Social Democratic Party. So where was your father in this and what, your mother's uh, uh, politics? My, my mother's family, uh, uh, grandfather and uh, her brothers were communist in the communist party and uh, my uh, father's family was more social democratic so how did how did the families feel about the social democratic marrying the communist and vice versa no i wouldn't say that this was important in terms of the uh, categorization of people mm-hmm. I think that the the political belonging was mainly, you know, something in terms of value, in terms of uh, um, exactly perspectives on the world, on people, on relationship. So I guess that what really connected all of them was this idea that I said, you know, in terms of community, um, generosity, you know, I realize only many, many, many years later that uh, um, my grandmother, uh, my my paternal grandmother on, on my father's side, um, actually the, the first seven years, or I have to say the first seven years of my life, we all lived together like a big family. My Parent, my grandparents, my uncle, my aunt, my father and mother, my siblings, my cousins, we, we were all living together mm-hmm. as you know it used to, at that time. And um, my uh, mother's family was living on the third floor, and my and us with uh, my father's family were living on the first floor. 
of this building, you know. So we were really very close, very uh no, I don't I don't remember what I was going to say. But this my oh I don't know. I I was wondering about I was imagining that your family, your both from both sides of your parents had been through a really hard time in the Second World War. Yes. People, people think the Second World War, a lot of younger people think the Second World War was like so long ago, but it was a few years before we were born. Yeah. Um, and that was the context, economic, political, social, um, yeah. that we were born into. Yeah. Yes, it was. And uh, the, the narrative in my family was very much a narrative of how uh, you know, Italy uh, resisted against the fascism and against Nazism. I mean, that was very important. My father, my grandfather, uh, and uh, was beaten up by the fascists because of his ideas. Um, my my the other grandfather was taken and. Uh, taken to, to a concentration camp in Verona from where he had to escape. So we were told all these uh, stories and the importance of, uh, you know, being uh, uh, against fascism, against Nazism, against uh, uh, dictatorship, against uh, everything that, uh, you know, is... Uh, is it's not, uh, it's, uh, it's not uh, the freedom of people, the democracy. Well, of course, political movements are based on ideologies. And one of the things that systemic thinking and theory has been very good at, is, especially with the advent of social construction, is to understand the power of ideology on everyday narratives oh. about who counts, what matters, what's possible. Um, and political movements also take a lot of organization, whether it's public or hidden, uh, local or international. So I... Yes. Um, I was thinking, you know, that uh, since you were asking, you know, my, the, the, the position of my family and, and, and larger families, with respect to socialism and communism, it's interesting because then, you know, when, once I came to, you, you have to think that being born in uh, 48, I was 20 in 1968, yeah. famous 68. So, of course, I also took part into the revolutionary movement of the students at that time. So it's interesting because, uh, of course, how can you become, you know, uh, take a position, an autonomous position with respect to your parents? They were already revolutionary, you know, they were already communist and so on. So, of course, I was even extra. <laughs> how, did you, how did you do extra? Because I had just wondered that same thing. How come you didn't become some, you know, awesome. nice, conformist, uh, capitalist wife? <laughs> I oh I think that that mm. that was so really out of the picture in my family. You have to think that uh, mm, there's a very important part of my life. That is, uh, when I was uh, sixteen, someone I was in uh, uh, my. How do you want to define it? It was third year of high school, third of five years of high school. So I was 16. Mm -hmm. uh, someone came to school and uh, said that if we wanted, uh, it was 65. You have to remember it was 1965. Uh, if uh, we wanted, we could uh, apply for studying for a year in the United States. So I went back home and said, you know, I want to do this to my family, to my father and mother. 
as I said, we were working class family. So we first thing my father said was, oh, what about the money? I mean, how much would that cost? And so I said, oh, I don't know, I don't know, but I really want to do this. I really want to do this. So just to let you know how my father is, uh, was and is, you know, he said, well, let me take information. I first want to see if it is possible. If it is possible, you can try. And so he, you know, asked for information. He contacted the families that had already, you know, had kids who did this experience. So he came home and said, you know, they told me that you can go. Uh, we don't have to pay anything if you um, show that, uh, you know, you are uh, good enough to to cope with this experience. So I went. I went for it in the United States. How old were you then? I, I was, uh, uh, I, I, um, uh, my, my 17th birthday, I uh, was born the 16th uh, of October. I did it in the United States. Wow. I became 17 in the United States. And, and where stayed there you? for a year. Where, where did you land? Where, where did you spend that year? In Chicago. Oh. <laughs> Chicago. Okay. In a family, of course. I mean, I, I was uh, with a family. It was uh, this program, this American Field Service uh, program, it's, uh, you know, exchange students. Actually, at that time, now it is an exchange students. At that time, it was all the world to the United States. But that was, you know, quite an experience for me. Quite an experience. In what ways? Well... First of all, uh, we were supposed to go around give speech about our country. Uh, we were very much um, into this idea of being, you know, like a, a diplomatic yeah. <laughs> ambassador of our countries. Uh -huh. And uh, so that was like, uh, you know, to put yourself in a position of responsibility in terms of... Uh, knowing what you say, um, of uh, also interesting in us, like being Italian, you know, uh, uh, fight against prejudice. Because for at that time uh, in the United States, Italy was just mafia. You know, now it's Italy is stylish Italy food, okay. you know, fashion and everything. But at that time, no, uh, you know, that was uh, the stereotype of uh, Italy in terms of Southern Italy, mafia and everything. So, you know, also I had to, to, to really, uh, you know, make arguments, show people that, that there was a prejudice, that Italians were different. And I, it's, it's a really interesting experience. Plus, I met many other people from all different countries. And so, you know, I had as a friend, a Turkish a woman, a Swedish man, an uh, Irish, an Icelandic one, mm -hmm. Southern Africa. Uh, I mean, that was really, really... That's really something. And yeah. tell me... Did you fall in love during that year? I mean, yes. 17 in Chicago. Yes, yes. Of course, of course. Yes. Did you fall in love that year? Of course. Of course, yes. But it was like, uh, you know, a period. And uh, I don't, I knew that I was going, just going, home. Yeah, going home. But that was okay. I have to say that was okay. How For did, example. How did, how was going home after that year then and what how did it did I it change your plans did it shift anything about your story of yourself and the future and what you're going to study yeah i think so well first of all i i wanted to go back many people said you know oh, you're the united states united states all had a fantastic period there i 
very grateful for this experience and everything, but it was also very happy to go back mm -hmm. home because uh, at home I was anyway part of a group of people, uh, young people as we were, but uh, involved in many volunteer initiatives, uh, you know, in town, which was not yet political. It, it became political, but anyway, at least it was a social involvement in community, in, uh, you know, also helping people who had no opportunities, you know, this kind of activities. And uh, so I, I liked to, I wanted to go back home. In, in the first uh, period, it was like shocking because it was so different in terms of culture and everything. And yeah, uh, but you, did you feel critical of Italian culture? No, Some never. Culture, never. No. The Never. I was critical of uh, um, the American culture, which I felt uh, as superficial and formal with respect to the way I was used. As I told you, I, I was used to a very community kind of life. And in fact, uh, there was a teacher in the high school I was attending there that uh, would um, involve students in the programs, uh, the social programs, uh, something that would help, uh, you know, the people, the students south of Chicago, which was the black community of Chicago. And we would go like uh, once a week, I think, helping children of those schools to do their homework. And there, that was the community, the style of life that I knew. You know, bits, you know, people staying, playing in the street, talking, chatting outside the houses. And that was to me much more similar to the community I was yeah. than the white middle class, yeah. high middle class. That, make, that makes me think a lot about how do we create, we maybe don't have to talk about this now, but it, but it jumps me to thinking about how do we create systemic places of therapy or treatment or whatever we want to call them, which feel like an extension of that culture rather than the, the South, sorry, rather than the North versus the South of the kind of distant streets and the big disconnected suburbia of clinic, uh, as opposed to people feeling a sense of ownership of the space. Has that influenced yeah. things in terms of how you how you've developed your practice? I, I, I think so. I think so because I, um, I think that I, I came to systemic uh, therapy thinking, going through political, First of all, experience. I was very much involved in 60, 69, 70, 71 in political, you know, uh, demonstration. I would, <laughs> I would wake up very early in the morning to go, you know, at the gates of the of the industries uh, around Modena, uh, you know, to 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 preach. <laughs> To talk to people and uh, and, to, and, to and talk. No, this is funny because to, yeah yeah to talk well, to the workers and tell them that you know the communist party was not revolutionary enough but that uh, there was like uh, more it was a more left position you know to 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 fight against the the landlords, you know, the owner of the industries and so on. So I did that for many years, you know. I was also um, uh, involved in, uh, as a representative in, in uh, the, the town, in the township. So, I mean, for, for those years, you know, which correspond to my 20, 21, 22, 23, 
uh, I was uh, politically involved a lot. Were, were you studying at the same time? Or were... I was studying. I was studying political sciences. Ah, uh... my my major uh, at the university, you know, in, in the undergraduate uh, courses was sociology. What were you planning to do then with a, a political sciences and sociology uh, tr uh, education? I was I was very much uh, thinking of, of doing uh, so the sociologist, which is you know uh, someone uh, uh, involved in the community uh, plans, uh, and uh, the, that was my idea. But during the the year of uh, the, my my university for year, I met psychology. Because I psychology was one of the exams I had to take. And I fell in love with psychology. But there are so many psychologies. There were then, there are probably more now. Which what which psychology was it you fell in love with? What or what was um, it? Um, the the reading um Gottsman. Irving Goffman. Yes, it's aliens. So say more about what grabbed you about Goffman's work. Well, because uh, of the analysis uh, he did of uh, the institutions, you know, like uh, prisons or psychiatric hospitals and so on. And uh, while I was studying this, I had the chance because one of my friend, one of my very, very, very dear friend, she was a social worker and uh, she worked with uh, within the um, psychiatric service. So here we have another or uh, yes, which uh, are is is you know converging here. She was involved with uh, that group of psychiatrists or that uh, were trained by Basaglia, who is uh, you know the psychiatrist that opened up the uh, psychiatric uh, hospitals and. Uh, actually closed down the psychiatric hospitals. So there I was in these years, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, I was at the university, I was politically involved, and I came across the experience of Basaglia and this completely, completely different way of thinking of the psychiatric illness. So so this was another political critique. Yeah. Whether it was political critique of factories and owners, uh, or whether it was a critique of uh, institutions, institutions. Like, uh, and their patients. Yeah, yeah. And I think that uh, the idea of, uh, uh, you know, of, of uh, seeing, looking at the psychiatric patients and seeing, make the effort to see something different that is uh, resources, yeah. human beings. You know, that was to me the, 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 the lesson by Basalia, which actually was what brought me to this profession. So it's it was because I did my dissertation actually on the experience of uh, the rehabilitation of uh, psychiatric patients. Uh, I, I my my dissertation was on this kind of experience, and that's against the backdrop of the closure of psychiatric hospitals. That's yeah. because, uh, the reason I was uh, picking up on whether you fell in love with psychology or which area of psychology you fell in love with, for me, is a big political issue because a lot of psychology and psychotherapy has gone off into decontextualized 
treating the individual as a, as a, a, site, a site of illness. And, uh, and even when you're talking about the rehabilitation, I'm imagining you were thinking about the rehabilitation in the context of community. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, the experience I lived was also uh, connected uh, with the experience in UK of um, Maxwell Jones, I think. You know, the uh, psychiatric community, uh, all, all, that was also a big experience, the democratic, what in Italian we call democratic psychiatry. Mm -hmm. which is a psychiatry that uh, recognizes, you know, the humanity in all people. And uh, the main reason there was institutions, I I institution make psychiatric patients what they are. If you free them from the institution, then you can finally see what they are as persons. And, in, and you're right, in, in the UK, we had a similar movement at that yeah. time. That yeah. has been not so much disbanded, so much as uh, uh, deflated by lack of public funds because it was yeah. never considered. The Richmond Fellowship, the Philadelphia Association, Arbus Association, mm -hmm. foregrounded a different story of people in context as, as, as uh, having social problems, psychological problems as social responses to the kinds of things. So I have to say that in, in Italy, the, uh, the ideas of Basaglia became a majority. Uh, it, it started as a minority, but it really, really spread all over and I think conquered all the psychologists, social workers, psychiatrists, and nurses of my generation. How do you think, that, do you think there was a connection between the kind of uh, socialism, communism of Northern Italy and the critique of power and ownership w with the dismantling or challenging of how psychiatric resources were? Yeah, yeah. I think, I, to me, this is all within a context of, uh, you know, looking of the perspective of looking at, you know, my position. I see that as a different aspect of one position of me being in the world. And uh, as I said, you know, the idea of community on one side and so solidarity you know, this idea of solidarity, of respect for people, of uh, importance of relationship. Uh, this comes from my family. This comes from uh, my studies. This comes from my experience in terms of political, you know, and, and also, I would say, group of friends, you know, with which we share all this. Wow. Yeah. The, the, yes. Friendships and politics mm -hmm. and professional interests yeah. Yeah. connected. Yeah. All connected. So, yeah. How did you get, what, what was the next jump? How, or was there an interim jump or several jumps into, um, I guess I'm interested, like probably many others will be by this point of, of I... did systemic stuff come in? Okay. So after I... I graduated, I, uh, at that time, there was not uh, um, a formal PhD program in the university. It was, um, <laughs> it was more like an apprenticeship, you know. I had a fellowship for two years uh, at the university. Uh, for studying and um, doing research. And at the same time, I had uh, a contract to work uh, in the psychiatric field, in the psychiatric service, 
where I had been working already for my dissertation. Okay, so after I I discussed my dissertation, they offered a contract for some hours a week to work in the psychiatric field. So after graduation, I was doing research at the university and working, you know, in the psychiatric field as well. And uh, we were doing this kind of program, you know, community program, um, taking all the, the, the long-term patient of the psychiatric hospital back home or at least in the community and also approaching the whole idea of the psychiatric illness from a very contextualized, community-rooted approach. Okay. Um, so, for example, as psychologist, I wouldn't sit in a study and, and in an office and talk to the patient. I would go see them at home. I would go and talk to the uh, to their landlord if this was needed. We would help them to cope with the, the everyday problem. Most of the time, these psychiatric patients were also you know, poor in terms of resources. And so they needed, you know, to be helped to uh, reconstruct themselves in terms of identity, of agency, and also, you know, being able to find the resources to live with. So we had all this... Um, what did that look like, Laura, in terms of helping people think about agency? Agency means they, they uh, help them to 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 believe they can make it. Was that just about belief, um, uh, or was it also about um, advocating differently for themselves? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yes. Yes. So I sometimes think advocacy is one of those very underplayed themes in the psychotherapies generally or social work, but that our, a lot of our job is either being an advocate or coaching an adv coaching our clients to become advocates for themselves or their children. That's, that's the right thing. That is it, you know. It fits with your politics and your yeah. personal experience yeah. about believing in change and finding one's own power on behalf of the family or the community. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I've done that together with other colleagues, um, psychiatrists, other psychologists. Yeah. Again, we were this group which were both, we would work together, uh, do politics together, be friends, just, you know, have dinner together, go to the movie together. I mean, this group of people. Now, at a certain point, it was um, mid-70s. The, the politics in Italy, it became very difficult because uh, we are talking of the so-called uh, uh, dark years of democracy in Italy. The fascist bombs who killed uh, people on trains or in the squares where people would get together on one side. On the other side, the Red Brigade who would uh, uh, attack the state, and uh, they wouldn't use bomb. They would kill people as example of uh, how the power had to be beaten, destroyed. Right. So if it was clear to me that, uh, you know, I didn't have anything to do with the fascists doing that, it was very difficult 
to see people that you would consider comrades in terms of um, wanting, uh, you know, the people, uh, justice, social justice, going so far to kill. So it was very difficult at that time in Italy to have a position in terms of... Presumably, if you were not joining with those extremes, then you were seen as some liberal, middle-of-the-road traitor which, to the cause. Yeah, which is was, it was difficult because at the beginning, that was the uh, accusation we would move to the communist party, who immediately, you know, took a distance from these people killing in the name of people. Mm. So for us, uh, my generation was kind of difficult because you would stand there between the Communist Party taking a very, very institutional position. The Communists are so accusing that you, know, you cannot do that if you are. You cannot talk in the name of people if you kill on one side. On the other side, you know, I was completely in disagreement of that. I was a, a, a nonviolent person, so I wouldn't share anything. Mm -hmm. That the communist has become a very, very a, 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 a crossroad for many of us of my generation. Also, in terms of age, we were coming to an age where we were asked to take responsibility in the profession. Some of us uh, uh, would have children. Uh, so it was, we came to an age where decisions had to be made. And uh, I think that my generation went you know, two, three different roads. One was the terrorism, the left, the red terrorism, which was quite, quite a difficult period in Italy. The other was drug heroin. The communist, many people started using heroin that period and, and die then. And other people like me, I think, that, uh, you know, just went into institutions, took the responsibilities that this meant. Some of us would have, uh, you know, responsibility professionally speaking, responsibility in terms of uh, being head of uh, services, of uh, programs, uh, and so on. So that was when, I think, I felt that uh, politics, values, community was not enough anymore. I needed something which would be more methodologically or epistemologically founded. Um, okay. Even something more, even more technically. Oh. You know, the, 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 the question was technically, no, it was more like methodological. Yes, yes, that makes sense. It was how exactly have have uh, uh, criteria for our actions, you know, methodology is this, you know, to have criteria that you can use, analyze situation and so on. And perhaps, and that, sorry, pardon? no, no, I, I, well, I was thinking about theories of change. Yeah. And the, the examples you'd given, uh, 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 this kind of crossroads that people reached where they had to decide which road to go down. 
was a sort of an, an, an enactment in response to change as a as a, a way of changing. Yes, exactly. Yeah, you said it put, yes. It was really how, you know, change, you know, when we say, you know, we are solicited, you know, by events, we cannot stay the same because, uh, you know, events ask us to change. People around you, situation around you, age, you know, and... Um, Meanwhile, I also uh, started my relationship with Gianfranco. I met Gianfranco. How did you meet? How did you meet? We met at the university in Bologna because he um, I was there with a fellowship, as I told you. Um, he, he came as a professor uh, of psychology. Uh, in the same department of political science where I was. So he was older than I was. He was uh, eight years older. He was a professor already. And uh, we met there. And uh, we started our relationship. Uh, I mean, in those years, exactly, you know, in terms of uh, change, those years was when I started a profession. I started the relationship, which has become the relationship of my life. Um, and uh, I also uh, started feeling that I needed to, uh, to have a more systematic somehow, you know, to put all these ideas together into a less uh, spontaneous uh, political way, but it was more like uh, the need for a, 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 a for, for instruments for reflection, you know, through criteria, methodological criteria. And that is when I met Mara Silvini Parasol. When you met who? Say it again. Mara Silvini. Oh, okay, I didn't hear. Okay. And um, so that was in the context of the university or in some yeah. other context? No, it was in the context of the university because I was uh, giving a seminar at the university on family relationships. And... Um, with... with uh, my Gianfranco and another colleague who was also professor uh, of psychology, we uh, decided to invite people, you know, who had recently written something on family. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. And uh, from different perspective, psychodynamic and. Uh, relational so we invited a psychoanalyst a very famous and very good i have to say psychoanalyst of bologna and uh, who had written a book on families uh, and mara silvini palasoli because paradox and counter paradox had just been published okay just in those years. And so that's how I, I, I met her. And of course, I mean, it was. But so you met her, I mean, tell me about that meeting. So there was the seminar you were presenting or she was presenting? She was, I invited her to okay. present Okay. within and, my seminar. And then what happened? You talked to her before or after? I talked to her, I, no, I, I talked to her after. And I said, oh, I think that these ideas, and he said, well, uh, do you have um, readings? Would you suggest me some readings to, to, to go further into this approach? She said, read Bateson. Oh. Read Bateson. And did you? And I did. So I then 
I contacted her again and said, you know, do you think of the teaching, do seminars, courses? And she said, no, I don't. But I have two colleagues, Boskola and Chekin, who are thinking of starting a training. So I said, well, could I call them? She said, yeah, here, yeah, they're the numbers. People need to remember there was no email in these days. No mobile phones, no internet, no websites, no Googling. No. Can I can I call them? Can you give me a telephone number? Okay. She gave and only telephone at home. No 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 cell phone, no mobile. Yeah. Okay. So you also had to call, you know. When should I call? You know, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to disturb or can I call? And so I called Bosco, talked to Bosco. And I said, you know, I would, uh, you know, I met uh, Lara Simi. But I saw she told me. Well, say it she... in Italian for a moment. Let's not worry about the English. <laughs> Just go oh. run through the conversation. Say it as if you were saying it in Italian. Okay. Ho incontrato, conosciuto la professoressa Selvini, la professoressa Selvini, Palazzoli. E... Ho molto apprezzato il vostro libro, ho chiesto se facevate dei corsi della formazione e lei mi ha detto che voi, lei e il dottor Cecchin, eh, state pensando di fare qualcosa. E lei ha detto sì, sì, stiamo pensando, ma how many of you are interested? He said, well, I'm not the only one, you know, some other could be. And uh, so I went back to the, you know, the psychiatrist I was working with. And I said, you know, they are thinking in Milano to start the training. So <clears throat> eight of us went. And the first training that Luigi Boscolo and Gianfranco Cecchin did was with a group of people from Modena, a group of people from Padova, where Gianfranco and Luigi used to go for seminars also. And so they met uh, um, Biaro, Mosconi, Peruzzi a group from uh, uh, Milano. And so we started. We were, they did two groups of 10, 10, 12 people. And uh, the training was this. They said, you can sit behind the mirror and watch us work. And then we would discuss with them and discuss and discuss and discuss, always watching them working. Every once in a while they would, uh, since they knew that I, I, I spoke English, uh, every once in a while they would come and say, are you interested in this article? <laughs> and, oh, we'll see. <laughs> Never asked me then, you know, well, but just, you know, giving some suggestions and, uh, and then they, they asked me to join them in the training as teacher and uh, that's all, you know. I feel it's so moving for me hearing this moment in time, both your own personal story of how you moved between the factory gates, your <laughs> own, you know, Chicago, North, South, and the factory gates, your own family histories and those uh, different discourses and uh, commitments and, uh, and your own education and the political science into political psychology or whatever one would call yeah. it. Then this meeting, the, 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 the hunch about inviting Mara Salvini Palazzoli and the asking for the phone number, the, the connections, the phone numbers, and the the kind of casual, but are there others who want to join this program? Yeah. And the little pockets that became eventually, I'm sure, the Teams conferences. And yeah. um, 
Uh, and there's something about how different this beginning world that I feel is so important for the systemic community to know about and own. Sometimes I've thought, Lara, um, when I've given stories about the history of uh, systemic therapy, uh, I've I've given stories sometimes using publications as my scaffolding for the story. And when I've, uh, I, a, f a few years ago, a colleague of mine, and Hedvig Wedler in Norway, said, oh, when I get back to Oslo, I have to give a, a seminar on um, the history of family therapy. Gail, tell me, tell me what you would say. And I quickly went, blah, 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 for a while. And then she said, it's so interesting. In, in Norway, we tell a completely different story about the history of family therapy. We tell it through the meetings that happened. And uh, for me, the, the papers offer the ideas and the, the temporal scaffolding, the chronology, the parallels going on in different places at the same time or overlapping. But I think nowadays the culture is, which program shall I apply for? Shall I go to Cardiff? Shall I go to Manchester? A uh, new program there. Shall I go to which which of the London programs? Shall I go to Birmingham? Shall I go to Leeds or Edinburgh? Or where where shall I go to do my training? And um, there are lots of politics involved in it. There's lots of issues to do with practicality, but there's a lot of choice in the in certainly in England and Wales and Scotland. I don't know about Ireland, but there no Ireland. I know, so Ireland proper. There it's not the right way of saying it. Ireland as opposed to Northern Ireland, I'm familiar with programs. The point is, um, these courses are now established in many. And there was a time when there was somebody called Boscolo who was saying, are there others of you who might be interested in these ideas? Of course, there were other family therapy training programs that pre-existed this moment in time. But in terms of Northern European interests, um, the Milan School was perhaps the most influential uh, in a lasting way um, in terms of theorizing change, uh, in particular, uh, in terms of theorizing system in a range of ways and engaging with a range of other texts as well, such as Bateson and then Maturana and so on. So it's very moving to hear these stepping stones um, and your yes, because you have to know that uh, there wasn't any uh, formal training in family therapy in Italy at that time. Mm. It was uh, just, you know, starting um, in um, Rome, Cancrini. <laughs> And uh, Andorfi, they started, but uh, they were at the university. So they were psychiatrists at the university. And so they, I think, became influential in terms of family therapy because they started, you know, in the, with the, the, the training of the psychiatrist, they start teaching these ideas. But uh, the, I think that the beginning of the training in Milano, because we were the first group of training ever, ever, <laughs> because, you know, exactly, they didn't have a program. They, they, and then you were invited into the teaching. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And but they didn't, at the beginning, it, it was interesting because the theory, of the training, the Milan training, we did it. I did it together with Valerio Versi. We wrote down, you know, a formal <laughs> program in terms of uh, readings and, uh, you know, topics and so on. So you, you, had, you had the inspirational leaders, initiators of the program, but then you put together as the the next generation, which was yes. a year or two later, you put you put together something, you put a formality or at yes. least a structure to it, so that students 
would benefit from every also, and 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 uh, Luigi and Bosco would continue to do what they have always done that is seeing families and discussing and you think that's a gen a gender thing here that sometimes uh, uh, men do the turn up performative stuff and the women do the a lot of the organizational stuff and some performative uh, maybe but it was um, the second generation was a mixed gender gender generation. Okay, I mean, there was uh, both uh, both and I mean, we were okay. We we actually were the the first two Valeria and I to teach, but soon after, other people were involved, and uh, both uh, women and men. And I think that the the next generation, with respect to Bosco and Chikin, were also uh, somehow, and uh, by Bosco and Chikin, and also offered, you know, to give a systematization of uh, the training, which meanwhile was, you know becoming more and more formalized, also recognized by the law, you know, accredited by the Board of Education. And then, you know, it's when it started the institutionalization of the training in family therapy. So so family therapy as a formal training was rolling out in Italy. What were some of the international inter, no international connections that had some resonance for you? Okay, it was um, Bosco de Chikin that invited me to teach to the first uh, summer school for foreigners. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. And do you remember anybody who came to that? Yeah, I remember uh, a, a guy who has been the editor of the uh, the Australian and New Zealand Journal of Family Therapy, that is Max uh, O'Connolly, or Max O'Connolly, I think. Uh, he contacted me when uh, when uh, Bostro died, asking for, you know, writing something. Mm. I remember him because he was staying, he was staying in, he, has, he stayed in Milano for three months or so. So he would attend also the regular training, you know, just sit there behind the mirror with the students and so on. So I mean, were, they, were these programs programs or were they, the summer school, was it more trying to create a community of conversation and practice? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Even if, you know, when people were asked to present, to say something. And in particular, what uh, Bosco and Chinkin involved me, not only there, then uh, they uh, asked me to go to the United States also with them, or teaching seminars. And then I went uh, to Israel with uh, Bosco. So both Gianfranco and Luigi invited me to join them doing things, uh, you know, internationally, which is how uh, then I also become involved in that. The, I also spent, uh, I went to teach as visiting professor at the University of New Hampshire for a semester. From there, I had contact with Lynn Hoffman who was living in Massachusetts at that time. And then we, uh, Luigi uh, and Gianfranco, Bosco and Chikin also uh, asked me if I was interested in uh, going to the Oxford um, team conference. The, and then the seminar with uh, Maturana also uh, that KCC organized actually, KCC and also the Institute of Health and so, uh, so how, do you, how did you experience the meeting of social construction 
uh, when you were in the University of New Hampshire. Presumably that was through, uh, I can't remember who was who would have been there at the time, but Sheila Mack. Sheila Jack Lanneman. Sheila, Sheila and Jack. Yeah, Sheila. Uh, I don't think John was there just yet. John Shotter. That would have been. Not, not yet. No. Yes. So he, he went later. Yeah. But uh, how, how did you understand, what did you go through in meeting social construction? Um, that was just just before social constructionism became uh, so important. But I have to say Gail, that my approach to social constructionism came from a different part because there's another change in my life. Okay. That is when I left uh, the profession, uh, the clinical profession, the psychiat working in the psychiatric synonyms, to take a position at the university as a professor okay. at the university full time. And uh, I, uh, I was teaching then social psychology. And it is through social psychologists, and especially the uh, so-called European social psychology, that is Moscovy C and Teifel as the major references, that I came across social constructionism and social constructivism. So, and and also, you know, through uh, Billings. Uh, uh, and I, you know, this person before then can go. Okay, okay. So um, I, I also recognize this as a very important part of what I am and of what I think that is uh, the study, you know. Okay. Uh, so, did, so did you go to New Hampshire after you started as a university professor uh, yes I, uh, yes uh -huh. I started as a university professor yes so you were in part carrying some of the social construction or constructivist ideas we I was at that time interested in uh, um, <laughs> CMM uh, how did you how, how did you find CMM uh, I found CMM through the the article by Cronin, Lanneman, Johnson, you know, reflexive loops, uh, strange loops, uh, and so on. Uh, and then I, a, a colleague of them, Sergio Pinotta, came to Milano to be trained in Milano. Uh, he spoke Italian being, you know, of Italian origin. And he stayed in Milano for a year. Then I, Bosco and Chicken, invited me to join them to a conference uh, in um, Cantari. That is where I met Sheila and Jack. Sheila, oh. me and Jeff Donald. And uh, we started, you know, our connection. We exchange ideas, starting from CMM, and how that would uh, apply to both research and uh, therapy. But we, at that time, I was interested to apply it to research, and so that's how we became connected. Sheila came for a year, for a semester at the University of Parma. I went for a semester at the University of New Hampshire. And I think that at that time, we all were, Jack, Sheila, myself, all very much into Bateson studies, especially Bateson. Mm -hmm. And then social constructionism came, I think, uh, later on. So, 
can can we can I ask you a bit about your own professional contributions? Um, uh, I know it's a bit tricky in the systemic profession. People like to talk about what we have done, the history, the the kind of community developments, and be, sometimes people are a little uncomfortable about focusing on their own work and the the gifts of their own work. But I'm wondering. How how can you describe what some of your written contributions have been? Um, uh, take us through some of the the key written publications or written contributions that have been important either to you or that you think have been important for the communities. Well, so we have to open a in whatever we, language in whatever language. Yeah, but we have to talk about this. The, the, how different it has been to uh, be part of the co international community being not uh, native in English. Uh, because, of course, uh, I think that the... Um, I, I think I have very much been in the international scene. Thanks to the connections, some uh, a special connection with uh, the colleagues in Dublin, you know, in Matilda and uh, the other, Philip and Roy, uh, KCC, Peter Lang, uh, Campbell, David Campbell, and the Parastock, colleagues from Sweden. Why am I saying all this call thanks to them? Because they they invited me. They invited me to teach, you know. Sometimes they invited me to write, okay? Because it was not that easy to be part of the international publications, not being, you know, a, a native in the English. So this is one thing. Very. So most of my publications are in Italian. Just going back a minute, are you saying there was a limit that that there could have been more opportunities, but people didn't consider uh, contributors, for example, who weren't first language English speakers? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that because of the situation, it was much harder. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm very grateful to all these colleagues I, I said, because they invited me. They, you know, sometimes asked for chapters, articles, and that was important to me. But just to, if I had to write something, I would write it in Italian. And sometimes in English, sometimes. But it's interesting, for example, that uh, uh, our uh, all the work we did, which was uh, uh, certainly second generation, on uh, on uh, the systemic approach in the public institutions, you know, psychiatric service, social services, and so on. Uh, were also published in English thanks to colleagues, for example, they Campbell as our paper, you know, asked us to publish, you know, our ideas about the mental health services in Italy. And, and not only that. So actually, you know, as I said, I'm very grateful to all these colleagues that uh, allowed me, invited me actually, invited me. Mm -hmm. So you know, really helped me to stay in that uh, scene, you know, the international scene. But it's, of course, most of my publications are in Italian. So which publications are you most I think I think uh, I, uh, my contribution to the field is that, that I embrace social constructionism without... Uh, uh, leaving out systemic. So the idea of system to me is not alternative to social constructionism. Mm -hmm. So social constructionism is more like 
the possibility of understanding the processes within the system. But uh, the idea of context comes from systems, not from social constructions. And data. Because I think that, uh, the, as I said, the social constructionism I uh, understand, practice, write about, work, uh, you know, from, uh, is uh, a mix of Bateson and uh, also a mix of uh, the contribution, as I said, of the social a European social psychologist. And um, always within the frame of system. I think this is my contribution. I never embraced postmodernism. Uh, meaning what and why? Um, this idea that uh, it was too much uh, individualistic. It was uh, too much um, based on um, a, on on a an individual construction. I think that. Um, Often social constructionism has really uh, been explained in terms of individual construction and uh, not in terms of uh, interaction as, for example, John Shocker instead did. I think that John really always you know, underline the interactive part, the relational part, but but the, the relation not in terms that I think of the relation that I act good because I want to be in a relation. You know, the relation as something that uh, you know unintended. You know, something that happened. The joint action has been what that mm -hmm. say. So I think that my contribution is this, and I've been very coherent in all these years, in, in my research and in my practice. I, I think that my contribution to the field has been this. I love that. Um, yeah, it, it reminds me of a couple of things. Um, one is uh, uh, you're helping me formulate an understanding of my first publication, which was called Incitement to Riot, the politics of a postmodern therapy and the social construction of individuals and group membership, some long title like that. But it was a critique around the, um, some of the ideological muddle that was going on <clears throat> between um, uh, liberal humanism and the social construction of the individual and the potential for social construction to situate people, well, systemic social construction, to situate people in communities. And, um, and social construction and systemic have had an interesting uh, relationship and a contested relationship. I remember Peter Lang saying that he was very clear that systemic and social construction were not the same. I'm sort of pointing with my hands to, the, to, to denote the same level of context in CMM terms. He, I think, thought that social construction, well, I'm thinking of Roseanne Leppington's 1991 paper in Human Systems, which was, uh, she pointed out that social construction was the highest context at a level of ideology that we're making our realities through language with each other over time. But that systemic ideas are the theoretical proposition that fall out of that. And then we go on to make method and, and so on. Um, but sometimes I feel that it's a false distinction and I would put systemic and social construction together because I can't see how one can make realities uh, or uh, whatever without thinking about the systemic context. Um, and I wonder, what what is this part of what you're talking about? Or how yeah. would it? Absolutely. I actually think 
uh, that uh, um, the, the systemic ideas gave us a very important perspective, which is uh, the perspective of contracts and uh, interdependency. You know, so if you move some part in the system, something happens in another part and in another part. So the interconnection. Mm -hmm. okay. To me, this is, uh, I don't want to say higher or lower, but it's, it's, it's a train. It's a very important train. Then, I think that social construction give us a perspective about what are the processes in this context, which is the processes of, uh, you know, constructing identities, realities, social realities, relationship, and so on. So, we need actually the, the social the constructionism gave us a, a methodological and epistemological tool to understand processes. But if you forget the system and the context, you place all this construction within individuals. Yeah. And, and this is exactly what happened. Because, I mean, people is talking of individual constructing. Individual do not construct. The construction is a result of an interaction. And the interaction is something that happens in the context. It doesn't come out of the blue, not out of our brain. It comes from history. And history is the context, which can change through interaction. So which is, which is the Laura Frigeri paper that if only one was allowed to be circulated in the world, which would you say, please, if you're going to read anything by me, read this. There is uh, a paper that uh, is not though the one uh, that I would explain all this. There's one or two papers mm -hmm. that I wrote in Italian. Actually, a chapter. A chapter in a book about Bateson, which I talk about the different construction isms. That sounds wonderful. Can't we get to make clear this point? And I make clear this point. And I also, you know, uh, point out that I don't like to talk about the observer. I, I like to talk about the social actor. Oh, lovely. And which year was, did you write that in? It was uh, 1984. Well, you know, there's always two, pub two dates. There's the publication date. And there's the when you wrote it date. So when uh, you were writing it in the early 90s. I, yeah, I think 94, 92, 94. I, I, I have an idea. I have a proposal. Always yeah. Were. Why don't we find uh, maybe that chapter and get it translated into English? I'd like to do that. And, it is, it is, I, I wonder how... Mm, well, you can have a look at it and decide. Because sometimes we look back at our writings and think, no, the moment. 94. So 93, 94, I think. Um, at the, in Murmurations, Journal of Transformative Systemic Practice, 
sometimes we, we usually have a paper um, that we revisit and the writer gets to comment on their the paper that they've written, make any additional comments, yeah. non-observations. And um, and uh, maybe that could be... Let's do that. Let's do that. So what... You know, I, I have a cut on file. So I, I have the paper in file, so I can send it to you. Great. That's good. I'm waiting for it. We've got just a few more minutes left. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the future of the world. What needs to happen in our systemic field or in terms of which systemic ideas that we could bring to the world? Maybe start with the first one. What, what does the systemic profession need? The systemic profession needs to, um, I think, and this is what actually I wrote in a book, that uh, will be out in in Italy in Italian in um, September, and it, we we I want to talk about this because I want to talk to you not now not today but about this other idea I have. Now we need to go back to the systemic tradition. We need to go back to the political uh, tradition of the systemic approach and uh, take seriously the idea of uh, co-construction. But also we need to uh, reflect on Hauer and this is, uh, you know, on our values, on uh, how we can still bring in difference in terms of uh, ideas, of uh, um, even of uh, ways of constructing reality. What I mean is that uh, it is, I mean, the, the systemic thinking, I think, is revolutionary in as much as we think that uh, healing comes from changing perspective. In this, the systemic thinking, the systemic therapy is revolutionary because we have the idea that people can feel better if they change perspective and see things from a different point of view. So it's revolutionary. But in terms, in, in order to be as therapist, revolutionary, being able to bring in differences, we need a lot to reflect on ourselves on how we are able to change perspective in the first place. So it's the idea of uh, Chikim, irreverence. But you know, irreverence doesn't come spontaneously because the whole cognitive system is conservative. So we need to exercise, to make epistemological exercises in order to be able to see things in different ways and give multiple descriptions of the same thing. This is the, I think, the systemic tradition. You know what I mean? I, I do know what you mean. It's the core of the systemic tradition, after all. You know, people are not always encouraged by institutions to feel they can be irreverent. They're meant to be following a path and produce a single story and uh, a predictable outcome mm -hmm. uh, within a certain language channel. And, uh, um, and I worry that systemic therapists may have been disempowered by our uh, alliance with an idea of institutionalized employment, mm -hmm. that we have become institutionalized as a profession, certainly in parts of the UK. 
and uh, to, but how do you think do you think that these radical ideas that you want us to come back to are just for the therapy room or is there no, 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 actually, the the end of... ideas have to play in the wider societal economic environmental worlds yes uh, well but not uh, at least being uh, a therapist and I, I think, yes, it can be, uh, it can have an effect on, you know, the, uh, on the world. If we keep uh, acting based on this idea of uh, changing perspective, giving multiple, you know, pres- uh, description of the same thing. But we do it from the position we have. You know, I'm not the Minister of Health. I'm uh, the people that will meet some other people. Maybe, but, you know, why not go back to the factory gates? Is there not something that systemic ideas have to offer somewhere else? Is it just a profession that happens from nine till five? Or are we doing what Leah Salter and I talk about now, a systemic living, where we are probably in any case, embodying a lot of our ethics, our systemic values across many contexts. Um, Yeah. Yeah. And this is what I would like to talk to you. Okay. Okay. I was was saying, you know, I'd like to have a conversation, you, Imelda, and I. Oh. About this. About how, you know, exactly... My story is a story where I, it's everything has been embedded, you know, even if for a certain period of time, I was actively, you know, in, in politics, you know, at the industry gates giving a pamphlet about how more communist the communist should be. <laughs> but uh, I don't think that that is what we need to do or not at, at, at this stage, for example. So let's... But how can exactly, how can again systemic become, you know, a perspective which is both political, technical, professional, and, and a way also of living with people, relating with people. Let's just um, do something playful to end with, something a little irreverent. We don't know what they're going to say, but I'd like to propose that we invite in an imagined reflecting team uh, in the form of uh, um, who you say. Well, we'll have Imelda. You just mentioned her. Well, imagine what Imelda might say about this conversation or or this last point in particular, rather than the whole conversation. Uh, Who else should we invite in for a quick comment? I don't know. For example, uh, I was thinking that uh, Luigi and Gianfranco. Yes, let's see. Who if were so. Um, Gianfranco, for example. Gianfranco, who was so creative, so irreverent, so systemic. He had very conservative, right political ideas both in terms of economy and in terms of politics and so on. So there must be something that uh, is needed, a, 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 a belt that has to be made explicit. It's not enough to have a systemic thinking in order to, you know, and I, I don't know. I, 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 I think that there is a, an ethic in uh, the systemic thinking and in the systemic way of working. I, I see how this, acting at this level, can have effects on other levels. But I don't know whether we should also take 
a political in terms of public collective position. This, I think, it would need to reconstruct community, as Imelda always says, because community is what has made the systemic thinking so rich and uh, and rooted, you know, and effective in in other communities. Mm -hmm. So probably the, the 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 problem of the systemic approach is that, uh, for example, the, the the big conferences. You know, I went to EFTA. That's not community. That is not, you know, being part of a community. Thousands of people, not being able to meet each other. The community we were part of were reflecting converse, conversational communities. We could work, meet, laugh, eat, drink, reflect together. So I think this has been lost. Well, it's and I wonder whether this is the political part that you are saying. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I mean, it's what we try to produce uh, in our spring school, winter school, summer school, whatever we're calling it at the University of Bedfordshire. Um, but um, it's still that political edge um, that worries me that we've developed now out of all these creative, spontaneous adventures from the margins challenging the mainstream and we've mainstreamed them into neat trainings with curricula. And while that is absolutely um, useful uh, uh, in one set of value sense, highly professional, um, ethical, and so on, there's something else that's missing from the story for me about, well, what does that mean for society? It's not just about working with the small and immediate unit of the individual, the couple, the family, the team. There's the bigger contexts. And uh, of course, now we're shifting into another paradigm uh, of uh, factoring in other material, other creatures, and decentering ourselves as uh, not only therapists, but as humans mm -hmm. in, in this. There are many systems we're part of that we can bring systemic thinking to if we're going to uh, be useful beyond the consulting room. So I, 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 um, I think this is a, a nice challenge that you're laying out it, here for it is. systemic communities. It is, I think. To think I about think. how systemic theories and practices and ways of understanding, ways of talking can be useful in other contexts, in wider contexts. We haven't stopped. Yeah. That's the point. We're still inventing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we still have question marks in front of us. <laughs> I mean, uh, now I have to say more than even we thought before COVID, because, uh, you know, we are in a situation where almost uh, uncertainty is, is the major thing, right? And... Uh, what I see is that people in front of uncertainty is uh, really taking more conservative, backward, you know, positions. I have this idea. I'm afraid that uh, this also, socially speaking, politically speaking, will bring more uh, dictatorship, more wish for, you know, the the man in power and so on. Mm. So this is a period when we really need to think. But I was talking about community as maybe the community of uh, psychotherapists, as maybe the 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 situation through which open up this uh, uh, 
uh, questions that we you were raising. Well, because, you know, I was thinking when I did politics, mm. you know, it was in a party. You know, a party was some, the community where you would uh, discuss idea. Where is the community where, you know, we can discuss these ideas that you were raising? And, and, and it makes me think about maybe where we're at in terms of the profession. We've become established, we're accepted as a form of psychotherapy and so on. But I'm, I'm remembering the point you made when you were describing earlier in our conversation about how you would maybe go to people at the factory gates and say, but the, the Communist Party now is, it's, it's mainstream, it's institutionalized. You need to look at where the more radical things are happening. And I think we need to perhaps also think that the systemic profession was radical and could be radical, but is maybe in a slightly uh, calm, uh, institutionalized phase right now that we have the potential to break out of. And this is probably true for a lot of the psychotherapies. They mm -hmm. be radical, they can be oppressive, but they have the possibility to become really revolutionary uh, with more social justice interests at heart. Mm, I think that social justice is the issue. You know, how, how we connect. You know, I was telling you before that uh, just before looking for new methodologies and so on, you know, I think that my profession was very much oriented by social justice, by the idea of social justice. That was, you know, the, the orientation, my theory in a way. And it came from your family as and well as came, then being attracted into the different professions. Yeah, and it came from my family. But now, you know, your comment made me think, okay, exactly how, how do we embed, implement social justice? I think that the systemic approach is a perspective that can, you know, help us. But how can we act in order to implement social justice as psychotherapists? Laura Frigeri, thank you so much for a delightful and inspiring and important and playful conversation today. Um, I've loved that. I hope you've enjoyed it too. But I have enjoyed it very much. And uh, I like how you helped me by the end to, you know, making the right words, ideas, it which is a way of sharing it. Yeah, yeah. It's a way of sharing it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you.